So today, we're going to be covering the last five verses, of, of, as I mentioned. And I titled today's message, A Glorious and Uplifting Ending. ending. Now, one of the strange ironies of human existence is that all of us are weak and needy. But we try to project the impression that we're strong. We don't need anybody. We're in the, completely independent. That we're self-sufficient. Now, a couple of examples that come to mind are our bodies and our finances. Now, yes, I admit, although some are more healthier than others, some are a lot more healthier than, than I am, than me, uh, for sure. The fact is that every single one of us, every person that is living right now, is physically frail. If you really think about it, our bodies are just delicate sacks of flesh filled with blood and bones and a bunch of other stuff in there. Yet, a lot of times, we act as if we're invincible. And also, regardless of your economic status, all of us are also financially frail and needy. The wealthy are always worrying about keeping their money. And the poor are always worrying that you don't have enough. Our bodies and finances are only two areas, but pick any area in life that you wish. And the conclusions are the same. Any area of life, you are weak, vulnerable, and needy. Emotionally, maybe you're doing great today, but tomorrow a series of tragedies could hit you as they hit Job, and you would be shattered. And what I'm getting at is that besides God, besides our Lord God Almighty, nothing in this life guarantees 100% security. He designed it that way so that we would be driven to trust Him for every single need. But in spite of this obvious truth, we madly scramble to find our security in, in other things. In the book of Revelation, the church of Laodicea thought they had it all together. In Revelation 3.17, they said, I'm rich, I become wealthy and need nothing. But God had a slightly different opinion. You don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. You see the difference? They had this self-image of who they were, but God saw them for who they really were. How could a church think that they were rich, wealthy, and in need of nothing, and yet God sees them as wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked? The irony is, when we see ourselves as God sees us, recognizing our desperate need for Him and cry out to Him, He's ready to flood us with his abundant blessings. As Mary acknowledged in Luke chapter 1, verse 53, he has satisfied the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Now let me put that another way. When we come hungry to God, he fills us. However, when we think we're rich and don't need God, he sends us away empty-handed. Now, this here is great news, that the only requirement for receiving God's abundant blessings is to come to him as a desperate, broken, needy sinner and ask for mercy. You see, he delights. Lord God delights to provide for those who rely on him, which is one of the points that we're going to be covering today. God has provided everything for our salvation through Jesus Christ. Through him, he will also provide all that we need to live for his glory. Now, if you were with us last week or you heard the message, in the last two verses that we covered 
last time we were here, I was here, we were here together, the author had just acknowledged his need by asking his readers for prayer. Well, now he, re he uh, returns the favor by praying for his readers in this wonderful benediction. Now, there may be some of you don't know what a bene benediction is. Maybe that word's too, too much of a big word, and that's okay. I get it. I was there once, too. What, what, what's a benediction? Is it like a Benedict Arnold breakfast? <laughs> well, in case you didn't know it, basically a benediction is a short prayer. It's a blessing that usually happens after a church service, after um, uh, maybe a special service, a funeral service. Um, it's a word of encouragement also. And so, you know, usually with us, it's usually the benediction would be the closing prayer that we, that I usually give after we're done with our message, with the, with the message. Now, it's been said that this particular benediction in verses 20 and 21 might be one of the most beautiful prayers ever uttered by a Christian. The tone reflects the writer's deep and sincere love for this church that he's writing to and how he just really just wants to be with him, with them. And so that's going to take up the majority of our message this morning. And then lastly, in the last few verses that we're going to be reading, we'll briefly cover the writer's brief exhortation, some final greetings, and then a blessing. So before we begin reading, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us powerfully this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for being with us this morning. Help us remove anything that may be a distraction, anything that might get in the way from really listening to what you have to say. Lord, we're desperate for your word. We're desperate and, and needy, and, and we want to hear from you, Lord. Lord. May all the pride be removed. May all the issues, anything that's, any hang-ups that we have, Lord, do you want to just humbly sit at your feet now and hear your word and pray that it will go out there, that it will, the seeds will be planted deep in the people's hearts, those that are here, those that are watching. Lord, and may lives change, Lord. Hearts may change. Lord, and, and people here everywhere, everywhere will just glorify you. So just fill us right now, Lord. Fill us with your love, with your spirit, Lord, and keep us safe. to speak powerfully now. You pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. And the word of God says, Now may the God of peace, who brought up from, who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, equip you with everything good to do his will, working in us what is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, viewed broadly, what we see here in these two verses is a declaration of absolute confidence in God. And it also shows the centrality of Christ's resurrection. But in a more narrow sense, in a more narrow view, you see that it reveals two important facts. First of all, it tells us that God has provided everything for our salvation through Jesus Christ. Now here, the author gives us five aspects, five aspects of our salvation. The first one being that God has provided everything for our salvation through Jesus Christ. Now in verse 20, the author refers to God as the God of peace. Folks, there's a lot of people out there, a lot of people who are desperately seeking peace for their souls. Maybe you're seeking peace for your soul because there isn't any. But 
in all reality, true peace can only come through being reconciled with God. The Bible teaches that we're born in rebellion against God. And because He's absolutely holy, He is completely pure, our sins, no matter how slight it is, it makes us enemies of God. Speaking of those outside of Christ, Paul said this in Romans chapter 8, verses 7 and 8. The mindset of the flesh is hostile to God because it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it's unable to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And in James chapter 4, verse 4, it says that friendship with the world is hostility toward God. Let me repeat that verse. Friendship with the world is hostility toward God. Also, those who are God's enemies usually have a hard time recognizing their true spiritual condition. Now, why is that? Because 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says that Satan has blinded their minds. As a believer, though, if you're here and you're a believer, you're a Christian, you're born again, one of the first signs that God is at work in your heart is that you begin to see your sin and guilt before God. You have that conviction when you do something wrong. You know deep inside that you're sinning against God and you're convicted. It's not condemnation if you're a believer. It's that conviction. And that conviction is meant for you to come before God, come before Jesus, come before the cross and ask for forgiveness. You recognize that there's no way that you can atone for your own sin and wonder if there's any way that you can have true peace with God. Well, the great news is, yes, there is. That's why Jesus came. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Now, before we get into how God actually did that, the second aspect of our salvation is that God has provided the great shepherd of the sheep that we needed. Now, this is the only time in Hebrews that the author refers to Jesus as the shepherd. But that metaphor is used often of him. In fact, John chapter 10, verse 11, Jesus referred to himself as the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. Back in verse 17, the author referred to the leaders of the church as those who keep watch over your souls. But even great leaders are imperfect shepherds at best. But as John chapter 10 Verses 29 and 30 says, Jesus is the great shepherd who doesn't lose any of the sheep that the Father has given him. Philip Keller, in his excellent A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23, shows that domestic sheep are some of the most helpless animals in the world. They li literally cannot survive without a shepherd. They need him to guard them from predators that lead them to pasture, to provide quiet, uh, quiet source of pure water and many other necessities. In fact, can even get stuck on their backs with their legs flailing in the air and die in that position. If the shepherd doesn't come along and set them, uh, if they, that shepherd doesn't come and set them upright, they could die. Someone has humorously pointed out that the domestic sheep has pointed out that domestic sheep disproved the evolutionary dogma of the survival of the fittest. And so the reason the Bible calls us Christians sheep is to point out the obvious, but that we often deny that we cannot survive. We 
can't survive without the good shepherd. God graciously sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be our good shepherd. The third aspect of our salvation is that God has provided by putting that shepherd to death for our sins. By mentioning death and blood, the author is reminding us that in his death, Jesus fulfilled all that the Old Testament sacrifices pointed toward. But again, as Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 4 told us, the blood of animals can never totally atone for sins. However, what those, sac- what those sacrifices couldn't do, well, Jesus did. As the eternal Son of God, He took on human flesh, just like us. Human flesh, perfectly obeyed God's law, and then offered Himself as the just payment for the sins of His people. Thus, the God of peace has provided a way for us, for you, to have peace with Him by sending the great shepherd and putting him to death for us, uh, putting them to death for our sins. Now, Leviticus chapter 14 prevents, presents wonderful instruction concerning the blood as seen in the law of the leper. Throughout the Bible, leprosy served as an illustration of sin. Like sin, leprosy manifested itself insignificantly at first, just a little spot under the skin. But it went on to spread so insidiously that it affected that it affected that the one affected would be cast out of the community entirely. If the priest found him healed, indeed, the former leper was instructed to bring two sparrows cedar wood, scarlet, and hyssop. One of the birds was then killed in an earthen vessel. The other bird, along with the cedar wood, scarlet, and hyssop, was dipped in the blood of the, that dead bird. And finally, the blood was also sprinkled seven times on the healed leper. And so the picture of redemption here is absolutely perfect. Like the leper of Leviticus chapter 14, we come to our great high priest, Jesus Christ, and follow him, remember, outside the camp. We covered that last week. Like the leper, the sacrifice of our Savior made on our behalf consisted of the cedar wood of the cross, the offering of his own life, the scarlet of his blood, and the hyssop upon which he was offered drink. The earthenware vessel where the sparrow was killed speaks of humanity, while the release bird soaring to heaven speaks of deity. The blood sprinkled seven times speaks as much of of completion as it does of the seven places from where Jesus bled from his forehead in the garden of Gethsemane, from his back due to the, to, the, to the whippings, from his brow due to the crown of thorns, from his face as his beard was plucked, from his hands nailed to the cross, from his feet nailed to the cross, from his side due to the soldier's spear. Seven times Jesus' blood flowed, providing complete forgiveness for your sin, complete healing from your, of your leprosy, and complete victory over the enemy. How wonderful is that? But he didn't remain in the grave. The fourth aspect of our salvation is that God has provided 
by raising that shepherd from the dead, thus confirming his covenant. Now, there is, in a sense, in which Jesus laid down his life and took it up again by his own authority. But in another sense, the Father raised Jesus from the dead by his mighty power. The phrase, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, is connected with God bringing Jesus up from the dead. The resurrection confirmed God's acceptance of Jesus' death as ratification of the new covenant, in which he said back in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12, For I will forgive their wrongdoing, and I will never again remember their sins. Additionally, the covenant is eternal, in a sense that it will never be invalidated or superseded. Jesus' blood is, my friends, the final sacrifice for our sins. That's it. And so the fifth aspect of our salvation is that God has provided Jesus, who is our Lord. The last phrase of, chapter, of, of verse 20 identifies the great shepherd of the sheep as our Lord Jesus. This here shows both the humanity and the deity of the Savior, of Jesus. Jesus is his human name, born of the Virgin Mary, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so as a man, therefore, this meant that he could die on the cross as a substitute for human sinners. The word Lord, however, is a title for sovereign God, for the sovereign God. As God in human flesh, Jesus' death could do what the death could do what the death of animals never could. Permanently, permanently take away our sins. The Bible is clear that while Jesus is Lord of all, he isn't the Lord of all in the same way. If that sounds confusing, let me explain. He's the Lord of some in the sense that he is their judge and will condemn them. But he's the Lord of others in the sense of being their savior. Those are the only two options, judge or savior. And so what this means is that if you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus, he's not the Lord of your life, you aren't born again, then you will be facing him, his judgment, one day soon as judge, as the judge. And because you die as an unforgiven sinner, he will impose the just penalty of eternal separation from him because of your sins. Does that make sense? When you die and stand before God, he will either judge you or save you. I don't know about you, but I'm glad I'm given, I've given my life to Jesus Christ. I'm born again, and then I don't have to face his judgment. I don't ever have to worry about eternally being separated from the love of God, from the love and grace of God. He's my Savior, and I hope that he's your Savior as well. So, now is the day, if you haven't done so. And I will talk more about this at the end of this message. But today, while it's called today, now is the day of salvation. Don't neglect the offer that I'm, I will be making at the end of this message. Please, your eternal, your eternity, 
your eternal soul, your salvation relies on it. So the first part of the author's benediction shows that God has provided everything for our salvation through Jesus, our Lord. But he doesn't just save us from his judgment and then leave us to fend for ourselves. No, not at all. Verse 21 tells us that God will also provide all that we need, all that we need to live for his glory. In that verse, the author confidently asks God to equip them, his readers, with everything good so that they can do his will and please him. Church, friends, we need God's help to do his will. We cannot accomplish it on our own. This is precisely why the author asked God to accomplish these things in his people. Our aim as Christians should be to do what is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. That's the only way we can please God is through Jesus. No one at all can please God without him. At the same time, the author asks his prayer to be fulfilled through Jesus Christ, whose great love for us leads us to leads us in glory to glory in the Father forever and ever. So the Amen at the end of the benediction closed the body of the epistle. It closed the body of this letter here. All that remained was for the writer to add a few words of greeting and personal information. And so let's read those last few verses of this letter, this chapter. So let's I'll be picking up in verse 22. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 22. Brothers and sisters, I urge you to receive this message of exhortation for I have written to you briefly. Be aware that our brother Timothy has been released. If he comes soon enough, he will be with me when I see you. Greet all your leaders and all the saints. Those who are from Italy send you greetings. Grace be with all of you. Going back just a little bit. One would think that the, the word amen, amen that ends the benediction would also mean an end to this letter. But as we just read, it's not, that's not the case. The author has a few more things to say and one last appeal to make. You see, he intends for his letter, this letter here, to be both an encouragement and exhortation. Even though it's important, he doesn't write to this church to just give them theological information. Now, that's good and all. But his main purpose is to exhort them to persevere in the faith. Thus, the appeal is to bear with his word of exhortation. The writer also wants his readers to know the status of Timothy. Now, yes, this is the same Timothy we read about in 1 and 2 Timothy. These are the letters that Paul, that's the person Paul wrote those letters to. Now, at this point, it appears that he's been released from prison. Now, we're not told why he was incarcerated, but we can assume that it was for the sake of the gospel. And if he's able to join the author, the two will visit the readers, this church, together. In the conclusion of this letter, we read the word leader for the third time in just this chapter, which again emphasizes the responsibility and stewardship of those who teach the recipients of this letter are also told that those from Italy send them greetings. 
this suggests that the churches have that churches have cropped up all throughout Italy, not just Rome. And those currently with the author send greetings to the church. Now, the writer of Hebrews closes, closes this letter with grace. There may be no more proper and precious way to end a letter like Hebrews than by asking God's unmerited favor on the recipients. See, this whole letter has really been about grace, about the grace established in the new covenant God made with his people through the blood of Jesus Christ. We've been saved, my friends, by grace. And we will endure until the end by grace. Grace be with all of us, indeed. Now, with everything that's, that we've covered in this chapter, in this book, the only, the only thing left to do, there's only one thing left to do, and that's to glorify God, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Christian, glorify him, glorify God for his peace. For it's his nature and his desire for his people. He has only thoughts of peace for us. Approach him with holy delight. Brother and sister in Christ, glorify him for his eternal covenant. What an amazing thing that God should enter into a covenant with us. Adore him for his blood, which sealed it. Bless him for our new hearts. Child of God, glorify him for giving us our great shepherd. For though we were all going our own way, he sent his son to save us with his lamb's blood and then to shepherd us. Magnify him for his shepherd's compassion and care. Church, glorify him that he has equipped us and enabled us to do his will and to please him. Even in the storms, even in the storms of life. So again, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Someone has written, uh, someone once wrote, empty hands I lifted to him and he filled them with a store of his own transcendent, uh, transcendent riches till my hands could no longer, uh, till my hands could hold no more. And at last, I, comprehend, I comprehended with my mind so slow and dull that God could not pour his riches into hands already full. Has God opened your eyes to your need for Christ? For your need, to your need for Jesus? If so, let go of everything else and just lay hold of Jesus. Let go of all those things that you've been holding on to, all those things that you've been running to and you found no true fulfillment. And just hold on to Jesus. He is that treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid again. And from joy, and from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. He is that pearl in uh, that the pearl of the of, uh, that pearl of great value that Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 13, that a merchant sold all that he had and bought it. 
church. In him, God has provided all that you need for salvation from his judgment. In him, God has provided all that you need to live in a manner that is pleasing unto him for his glory. Make sure that your faith rests in the risen great shepherd, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So we'll end this message by asking you, asking those watching, those watching and listening, whether you're watching this live or you're watching, you're hearing the recording or watching the recording later on. Has God opened your eyes? Do you see your need for a Savior? Do you see that you're a sinner? Are you willing to come to Jesus, confess your sins, and make Jesus the Lord of your life? If you are, I want to lead you into prayer to do that. If you're tired of living in sin, if you're tired of finding no fulfillment in, in anything, that hole still exists in your heart, come to Jesus. No matter how bad you think you've blown it, no matter how bad your sin is, He will forgive you. and He will make you new. A relationship that was broken long ago at the Garden of Eden will be restored between you and God. Don't let another day pass. You never know. You never know what can happen to you after you leave this building, after you watch this message. This could be your last opportunity. So let's pray. And if you're ready to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, pray this with all your heart. Lord Jesus, I know and I admit that I'm a sinner. And I ask, I ask you truly for your forgiveness. I truly do believe now that you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I repent of those sins, Lord. I turn away from those sins and confess you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. So now I ask you, Lord, to fill me completely with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me and teach me and be there with me in the the loneliest of times He will do all these things in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. If you pray that, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We want to hear your story. We want to help you in your next steps. If you're here locally, we invite you to come check out our church, you know, and and, and see if you you like it here. The Lord is calling you to be here. We have no restrictions. We have no membership. You don't have to sign up for anything. You don't have to give anything. Um, Just just sit in one of the empty chairs and come hang out, and we'd love to meet you afterwards. But, um, but yeah, let us know how we can minister to you, how we can help you. If you need prayer, again, as Isaac mentioned in the beginning, um, send us, uh, fill out that that prayer request, and and it'll come to me, and, you know, I'll pray for you. 
my wife will as well. But uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here with us. Be safe, be good wherever you're at, be a blessing. We love you, goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.